Hey guys, hope you're doing well. We're doing another topic video. This week I asked you guys for more of your hot takes. Before we get into that, I will plug my website. It is deepfocuslens.com. I am an artist. I do commission portraits and I sell prints. If that is something that you are interested in, you can always go to the website below or if you have a question about a commission or a print, you can always email me. My email is in the description box below as well. All right, let's begin. People getting mad at you for liking a movie is ridiculous and happens way too often. I don't know if that's a hot take. I think that's one of those things where, like if you say it on the outside when you're not riled up, you'd probably agree with it. But at the same time, a lot of people get angry, get riled up over uh, movies and opinions without realizing it. So uh, yeah, I totally agree with you. People get far too angry and we're all guilty of it. We all get really passionate about something and maybe go overboard in terms of defending it. We act like it's a, a personal attack. There are some people who contact me just all day, every day you know, about one opinion I had a year ago that they disagree with. And it's just like, you know, dude, you gotta get a life. But I do understand at the same time, art, you know, deals with kind of the more vulnerable aspects of ourselves, even when we don't realize it. A lot of times when you think movies are entertainment, there's so much, there's subliminal messages. There's like, you know, it's tapping into so many, uh, dark interests and desires, I think. Darker parts of yourself and your, your subconscious that you don't really realize. And I think that's part of why when you really, really love something and somebody else dismisses it, it does feel like a personal attack because it feels like maybe an aspect of you. I don't excuse that, but I'm saying I kind of understand possibly where it comes from, even if I, I wish it would go away. Bo Burnham's new special is the epitome of pathetic self-pity. The whole time he goes on about how no one wants to hear about his privileged white struggles and then goes on to make a dozen and extremely repetitive songs about it. They aren't even funny. I mean, at a certain point, constant irony and self-awareness just bends back on itself like an Ouroboros and stops reaching new, for new territory. Um, so I can't agree with um, necessarily your tone there because it's like a little bit, I think, aggressive uh, because there are things that I really admire about Bo Burnham's special. But in terms of just what you're saying, I agree with you so much. Like this comment is so refreshing to me because everybody talks about how it is such a masterpiece and I saw it and I, yeah, I, I echo a lot of these sentiments. I think it's a really original, very creative way to do a, a Netflix comedy special. Um, so in that sense, I'm, I'm really uh, intrigued by it and I, I do appreciate his passion and, and yeah, like that, that ability to be able to create something out of very little, just like a light, just very practical special effects and make it effective. It does have a really nice cohesion about it and it does touch on very surface level points of kind of where we are, you know, just like the digital world and, and isolation, the lack of connection and how that, you know, works in the pandemic, you know, during quarantine. Hipsters love this film. And I was talking to uh, one of my friends who thought this was a masterpiece, of course. And, and he said, why didn't you like it? Did it hit too close to home? And I was like, actually, it didn't hit close to home at all, which is so strange because, you know, it's, it seems like the type of thing, especially content creators can relate to because it really is kind of our lives. And it was our lives, you know, in an abstract sense, you know, during quarantine. Putting out content constantly, but yet you have no connection uh, to those people other than what you see on a screen. I even turned 30, just like he did uh, during quarantine. So there's a lot that I could relate to, and yet I felt completely disconnected from it for a lot of the reasons that you're saying here. It did feel like just like a summation of just 2020 sucks. And I find that to be kind of a really uninteresting angle. I get tired of the way that we approach the pandemic, especially in our art. There are so many, I think, interesting, very existential things to say about isolation and what that can do to you. Also how it can open you up. Also how it can transcend a certain sense of art. And he touches on kind of the basic ideas of white privilege and, and politics as it exists very much on the surface level. I do think people mistake in self-awareness and irony for being clever or being deeper than it is, I should say. And uh, I don't think that's necessarily true in this case. And yes, there's a lot of meta aspects to this film. It's very meta textual. And again, yet yeah, it just felt very whiny in the way that a lot of millennials are, which, you know, I think is the point partially. But at the same time, as I said, I grow bored of, of the way a lot of us look at the pandemic and, and all of this um, in a way that just feels very one note. And I, I don't know if it was me, I'd want to go for something um, more unique than that. But even just with the main character, it is Bo Burnham, but you know, it's like a very Bo Burnham in a very abstract sort of sense um, for the purpose of the film. You know, he's sitting here complaining about all this stuff. And I'm like, dude, you are living the dream. You know, like you're complaining about all this stuff and how you know sad it is to be in quarantine. I'm like, this this seems like a dream to me. 
I don't understand what's so sad about it. You get to sit there and make content and get paid lots and lots of money. Oh, that sounds great. So therefore I just feel kind of disconnected and like get over it. It does sound like I'm really bashing it. Like I said, I, I did really appreciate the creativity and some of the songs I did find clever. I just, I don't think it's um, nearly as deep as a lot of people are saying. There should be more black and white films and television series done right. Color has become the default while the odd black and white film has been relegated to simple nostalgia or a quaint gimmick a la The Artist, which in my opinion was a derivative callback to films that are frankly much better. The same can be said for Francis Ha, which while well made, had absolutely no motivation for being black and white besides to say, look how different and alternative we are. Black and white done right is a beautiful medium for storytelling, and I wish it was used more, especially in the mainstream. It's just my humble opinion, of course. Curious to hear what others think. Oh, I totally agree with you, though. I can't agree. I actually thought the black and white was very effective in Francis Ha, if I recall. I mean, I haven't seen it in years, probably since it came out, but um, I don't recall it being, you know, a sort of gimmick. I felt like it was you know, just there. And I don't have a problem with people doing black and white just because they want to do it. I don't think it has to have some deeper meaning or anything like that. Like if I was going to make a movie, I'd probably do one in black and white just for shits and giggles. A big part of it, I think, is because I watch so many old films. Like that's more my, my medium is like, you know, historical films, films from, you know, like the golden age of Hollywood and such. Um, so I'm used to it and I love the way that it works. And like Orson Welles always said, everything is better in black and white. And I don't, I, I, I agree to a degree because it's like, there's something about when you have a face, like if you take a picture and then, you know, it's in color and then make it black and white and go back and forth, it's amazing just how much black and white can reveal. I think a lot of people think that black and white somehow detracts or it or it um, minimizes the art. And if anything, I think it enhances the emotion of it, enhances the vulnerability because there's no distraction of like, you know, the color of hair, the color of your sweater. It highlights the shapes, it highlights the features in a way that bring them forward in a very dramatic, very intense, very cinematic way. I think that um, black and white is perhaps the most cinematic in some ways. I love color. I think color is extraordinary and people use it in all kinds of amazing ways, but I also think that there's something to be said for black and white and just the, the, the drama it creates. Cinema is totally not dead. There's plenty of cinema today. Of today, people just need to know where to look. It's certainly not mainstream. There are plenty of promising filmmakers. I am doubtful of many future mainstream classics coming out on the level of Star Wars or The Godfather, and I think this is mostly due to the deterioration of culture and intelligence of the masses. Um, I don't actually think it has to do with the deterioration of intelligence. I think it's just, you know, our interests lie somewhere else. For so much of the 20th century in particular, film was that medium. It was at the forefront of our entertainment. And now it's not, so you have to resort to things that are just really kind of gimmicky and ridiculous and over the top to be able to get people back uh, into the cinemas, but you know, film, or, or I'm sorry, TV is, is very good and the writing in TV is very good. So no, I don't think it has to do with the lack of intelligence. I think that cinema is dead in a certain way, but more in the way that you're saying, like, I don't think we're going to have, as you say, future mainstream classics like Star Wars or The Godfather. And I don't think we're ever going to have those, those big event films. I know they're trying to have those still, but they just don't exist in the way that they used to. And yeah, as I've said many times, we're just moving on to something different and that's okay, but that does not mean that film is dead. There are still, I think, some of the best filmmakers ever are alive right now, and I think some of the best movies that are being made are happening right now. I think of it a lot like plays in a way, because it's like at the end of the of the 19th century, motion pictures begin to take shape, and it's like, oh shit, uh, what are we going to do? What are power plays going to survive? They're fine. They still exist. Uh, maybe a little bit more novelty, but absolutely people go to the theater. It's just not the mainstream artistic medium that people gravitate towards in the modern day, but that's okay. And I, I really think that's going to be the same for films. There's always going to be a place for them, at least for a while. There are no great American actresses. <laughs> um, I, I don't think that's true, um, but I, I see what you're saying. Um, I mean, one of my favorite actresses of all time is Sissy Spacek. And I think that she has something very special that a lot of um, American actresses don't have. But I do agree that by and large, when I watch movies made in Hollywood, I watch American films, um, you know, I like the performances by the actors. There's certainly talent out there, but it's just not transcendent talent. It's not bold. It's not nearly as risky 
um, as a lot of talent that comes out of, say, Europe. There's a lot of European actresses that I really, really admire because they are bold. They are unafraid to really go to some of the scariest, darkest places. And I think part of it is just the industry that we have and the way that it is, where it is geared. It's very much a, a business model. And a lot of that has to do with Harvey Weinstein, other people as well, but just in terms of how it has shaped in my lifetime, it's very much garnered to Academy Awards. And it's like everything is a packaged deal. So I think a lot of people, a lot of actresses want to do the, the types of roles that, you know, are emotional enough to get you noticed or recognized at award shows, but not so deep into dark, crazy, um, unrelenting territory that, you know, it's inaccessible, you know? So they are always kind of trying to stay in that safe mode, it feels like. And I think that's really part of why. Tim Burton will make a comeback. He's been in the game for quite a while. So recently he's had to make some duds to compensate for his amazing early work. Directing careers are like albums. They have to have some lesser tracks to space out the hits, unless you're Kubrick. Uh, I, I don't know. I, you could absolutely be right. I never want to just doubt and be cynical and be like, nothing will ever be good again from this person. Um, cause I don't see a reason for that, but, um, I find it, I don't, I don't know. I don't think that's going to happen, but I hope it does because Tim Burton is somebody who is very talented. I went back in uh, like 2011 in Los Angeles, I went to his big, um, exhibit and it was really amazing. I mean, the guy has an incredible vision. It gave me a whole new appreciation for him. But unfortunately, yes, I mean, he did have some very original, very interesting works. My favorite film he ever did by far was Ed Wood. I think the last great film he made was uh, uh, Sweeney Todd, but that was so long ago. And yeah, he's just done a lot of very lazy commercial films that do kind of carry his spirit, but in a very glossy, very almost like McDonald's Happy Meal sort of way. And it is unfortunate. It happens. It makes me very sad when I see directors with that vision kind of sell out. And yes, I do hope that he hasn't lost all of that. And I would like to see him do something, return to his roots and make something um, more original, more personal. But um, I don't know. Hereditary is not that great. It's good, but it's not as great as people thought it is. The one thing that elevates the film is the score and Tony Collette. Um, I think Hereditary is really awesome. I really, really like it. And I think, you know, stylistically and in terms of just how they're building the tension and everything, all that I love. It does remind me of a lot of, you know, 70s movies that I liked or 80s horror films, but done very, very well in a really twitchy, you know, strange sort of modern sense. But I do agree the plot itself, I did struggle with it towards the end, uh, especially the second time I saw it. A lot of those things were really glaring to me as, Mm, that doesn't really make sense enough to take me out of it. And I can't even remember the specifics at this point, but um, yeah, I just think it was a failing of the script. Um, but had they resolved that, I think it could have been, I honestly think it could have been a near masterpiece. But yeah, the score is fantastic to it and Toni Collette is wonderful. And I think Toni Collette, I really do love her, but she does have an ability to really kind of She's an example of somebody who's not afraid, who is very um, versatile, and she can really go to scary places and, and you know, contort her face in ways. And um, I think here is where we got to see a lot of that fire, allow her to get aggressive and take command of the screen in a way that I, I don't see from her very much, even though she is very good at playing, you know, really dark and um, uh, characters in a lot of pain. When someone says they don't watch foreign movies because they don't like reading subtitles, what they really mean is they don't want to have to sit through a story full of people that they don't want to relate to. I think you were right about some people, absolutely. Um, but I don't think that that's, I think it's kind of dismissive to say that everybody does that. I don't like reading subtitles. If it were up to me, I would know all the languages in the world and all the, you know, different movies. I'd be able to understand them because I don't like that I have to read when I could be looking at the screen and absorbing, you know, the, the expressions on the faces and the background, the foreground. I like to really experience the composition. And I hate when I'm just constantly having to read because I can't focus on those things as much. That said, certainly, absolutely, just like anywhere, you know, the idea of reading it, like it takes extra effort and, you know, you're not going to want to do that, especially when it's something that maybe you don't connect to, I guess, you know, a lot of people are like that. Me personally, I'm very curious. I'm very interested about different cultures, especially the way that, you know, different filmmakers all over the world perceive certain things compared to where it is done here. So yeah, I really think it's a mix. I do think there are absolutely the people that you're talking about who just don't want to 
have to relate to people they don't understand. But I also do think a lot of it is just because, you know, it does, it is distracting to a degree. But um, yeah, so those are a few of your hot takes. Thank you guys so much for writing in. And that is the video. Thank you guys so much for watching. Over here you will see my Patreon supporters. Thank you guys so much for everything that you do. If you are interested in becoming uh, a patron, the link to support that is below, as well as the rest of my social media information. You can watch more videos here, and you can subscribe if you'd like. Catch you next time.